All right. So, well, first of all, I'm aware that um, Grindhouse releasing <laughs> didn't make uh, Brain Dead, Dead Alive, or this movie. I just love that opening music for uh, that that company. So that's going to be in the video from time to time. Let's tackle another horror Leviathan here. Now, this movie, The Shining, Stanley Kubrick, from 80, right? 1980. Yeah. This is a hard movie for me to talk about because if I recall, I didn't even put this in honorable mentions for like my top horror films of the 80s. I think this is a masterfully made movie. And it's an absolute classic, and I adore this movie. It's just not that high up for me, like it is for so many people. Like when you see this movie, even a lot of the times, the top three, top five horror films of all time, it's just not that high for me. It's not. And I think some of that might have to do with, I mean, I'm a huge Stephen King fan. My three bookshelves here are all Stephen King, <laughs> and I love the book, The Shining. I haven't read it in forever. But the differences between the book and the movie, I'm not going to get into much on it at all, but just all of the, the, the dynamic between Jack and Danny and the alcoholism of Jack and that his whole mental degradation throughout the, the story and everything, it's just not as well handled. Like, this is Kubrick's own little version. We all know that. We know that Stephen King hated this <laughs> when this adaptation came out. He hated Kubrick's version. And I can see that. I mean, he m changed a lot of King's material in the, from the book. And a lot of that was autobiographical because he was just full-on alcoholic at the time. So I can understand Stephen King's reaction to Stanley Kubrick's version and adaptation of his story. A hundred percent. And that's some things that maybe hold this movie back for me from being like in a top five horror film or something like that. There's just so many other films that I put higher than this, but it is a masterpiece. Like I, let's not like, <laughs> I, let's not like, uh, what the fuck is the word I'm looking for? <laughs> oh man, it's late. No, it's not. It's like nine o'clock. <laughs> so I'm fucking lying to you. Um, Let's not try to uh, not, you know, deny here that how fantastic this movie is and what a cultural significance and, and the, the impact on film that this movie had. And this movie does have one of my favorite shots in a, in a film. Like, we'll talk, to, we'll talk about it, but one of my favorite shots in a film is in this movie. And we all know how big of a stickler... Kubrick was with filming his movies like he would film scenes dozens and dozens and dozens of times just to get them right and <laughs> there's a few things in this movie that I'm not sure I'm pr I'm pretty damn sure it's deliberate knowing Kubrick but that I'm not sure are deliberate or if they were just mistakes and I'll point those out but one thing I do agree, I mean, Jack Nicholson is one of my favorite actors of all time. So, I mean, he kills it in this. But that's another thing I agree with King about. I feel like he was miscast here. As blasphemous as that might sound, I feel like Nicholson was not cast well here. He kills it and gives a great performance. But compared to, again, going back to the story in the book, Jack just looks insane from the beginning. Like, there's no real... I mean, there is, but not like in the story. Not like in the book. Like, the Jack there is a more of an everyman, normal-seeming guy, just with an alcohol problem. And he, you see the degradation mentally and just emotionally, everything, as the story goes on. Here, Jack Nicholson just looks crazy from the beginning. Like, he looks like he's ready to murder his family on the car ride. Like, that's how he is. And I feel like that was that was not the right choice. As strange as I can't picture this movie without Nicholson. I can't. And let's not even talk about the miniseries that King did. <laughs> but I do, I forget his name. He was, he's in Friday Part 6, who plays um, Jack Torrance in the miniseries. 
That's a better pick, though. I think he was a good pick to play Jack. Way too crazy. But let's talk 1980s. Unbelievable movie, The Shining by Stanley Kubrick. An absolute masterpiece of film. And I'll blanket this, as I do with certain movies by certain directors. Every shot, the cinematography, everything in this movie is fucking phenomenal. The directing, everything. The score, it made my honorable mentions of top horror scores of all time. It's not, I don't, it's not top 10 for me, but it's definitely in top 20. Wendy Carlos is fantastic. Her score is fantastic. Clockwork Orange is one of my favorite scores in a film, and she did that too. Unbelievable composer, and it works so well in this movie. And from here on out, I'm not going to talk about the story much, like the book. I'm just going to keep this contained to the movie. And just the whole, the opening establishing shots, and just from the helicopter shots of the car driving with the, the woods on the sides of it. This is such a gorgeous film, man. Like, and <laughs> it's funny knowing how, how much of a stickler Kubrick is and how much he take shots over and over again in like one of the air like the shots in the opening here you can see like a helicopter blade or a propeller or something in the shot so he, he didn't notice that shit let's talk Shelley Duvall now I know the terrible treatment that she got filming this movie with um from Kubrick specifically that he just really mistreated her on the set making this. That's terrible. But I also don't think she was a good cast either. <laughs> I don't think she was cast well either. Shelley Duvall, she's hard to look at for me, man. Like, she's just... It's not even about, like, being attractive. It's just the way she looks. I, I don't know. I really think they, sh they could have got someone much better. I don't know who. I'm just thinking of this on the spot. But somebody better than Shelley Duvall. I mean, she does great. It's just hard to look at, and she's hard to look at for me. It's just a me thing. This, I'm sure maybe some people feel the same, but for me, they couldn't. They could have cast someone better than Duvall. And the fact that Kubrick showed David Lynch's Eraserhead from '77 masterpiece to all the cast members and crew to show them the mood and the, like atmosphere and feel that he wanted to evoke for The Shining. That's such a great story. Like, that's so awesome that he did that. Like, he had respect for Lynch, man, because who doesn't? And the whole setting of the Overlook, it's a, it's, a, it's a character of itself. The hotel is its own character here. And it's so disorienting. Like, this whole hotel, I forget where they filmed it. Oh, why, why am I blanking on it? But whatever. It, it It's its own character in this. It's like a maze, just like... The hedge maze outside, which we know in the story was like animal maze sculptures, for lack of a better term. Stupid. <laughs> That's one thing I don't like about the story in the book. The topiary animals coming to life and stuff. The hedge maze is such a, an improvement on that. And that has to do with my favorite shot in this movie. And Danny, why do I always think I forget the, the actor's name because I say Danny Lloyd, but then I, I double get, I second guess myself because I'm, I'm thinking of Jamie Lloyd from Halloween four and five and six. So then I think, no, that's not right. But then it is right. It's Danny Lloyd, right? <laughs> like I'm pretty goddamn sure. But Danny Lloyd, kid actors is always hard. And especially for to carry a film. I mean, he's not carrying it the whole way Jack is, too. I mean, Nicholson. But he carries a decent amount of this movie. His performance is excellent. Like, this kid really looks disturbed and frightened and in so much fear throughout this movie. Like, when he's shaking, like, shining and stuff, like, to uh, DeCalloran, when he's down in Florida, and that... The way that's filmed with the music and... The, God, man, Danny Lloyd's performance is one of the best child acting performances in a horror movie for me. Now, one hit, one thing on the uh, Grady twins, which are so iconic from this film, the twin girls. They're not supposed to be twins. And I think most people know that, who know this story and this movie well. 
Allman, in the interview here at the beginning, mentions the Grady family, mentions Grady, and that he had two daughters. And he says that they were eight and ten, or seven and ten. I think it's eight and ten. But he specifically says that, and it's in the book, too. I don't know if the same ages, but I know they're not the same age. But they get referred to all the time as the Grady twins. They look like t- identical twins in the movie. So that's a fuck up. Or just C- Kubrick just doing whatever the hell he wanted and just ignoring the source material. Just thought it was creepier if they were twins. It still works. It's still effective. But they're not goddamn twins. Yeah, eight and ten years old. The uh, Omen says they are. Or were. They're, they're fucking dead. Now, there is a lot of mirror symbolism in this movie, both with literal mirrors, which is pretty much every time Jack is seeing ghosts, which leads to, there's so many theories and interpretations of this movie, it's insane. This is the whole uh, 237 documentary, just diving into theories on this movie, which the ending, I still don't know what to think of it. But Jack, in the interview, with the guy sitting right next to him in front of Ullman, mirroring Jack how he's sitting there. Like I said, all the shots of him talking or seeing ghosts or talking to himself or talking to what he thinks are ghosts, all in mirrors, except for when he's in the pantry, but it's a light reflective you know, door, so it's pretty much like a mirror. So much of that throughout this whole movie. The, 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 twi- the twins, quote-unquote, the Grady twins, so we see a lot of mirror symbolism and like duplicity duality in here whatever the correct one is see this is what i mean with nicholson i mean like right when he tells jack about the uh grady family and that he ended up killing his wife and his kids he goes well mr Dolman, this not i can tell you that's not gonna happen to me he looks like a fucking lunatic (laughs) <laughs> like right off the bat here he looks like he's already lost his mind he it looks like he's already planning how he's going to kill his family in his head right then and there like that's just one of the missteps that kubrick took with this movie for me he looks way too insane dude there is a shit ton of kool-aid <laughs> on top of their fridge at their house jesus they have a lot of kool-aid now the whole thing with the finger when he's talking to um Oh, come on. <laughs> I gotta not smoke before doing these. The, um, his fucking friend. That whole thing is perfect. What a cool, what a creepy image that is every time that he's talking with his finger like that. And then we have the shot with the blood coming out of the elevator that he can foresee, I guess, from before they even get to the Overlook, because then he sees the Grady twins also. What a fantastic shot that is. And then the same thing with um, him. You see the shot of him screaming, with it, but he's like, it's silent, it's not helping. Ah. <laughs> Dude, this, oh, the cinematography in this movie, it's the way that things are shot, it's, it's so excellent. Fucking Tony. <laughs> that's his, his name. I kept wanting to say Captain Howdy, and I know that's the exorcist, so I was like, no, that's not right. Yeah, Tony. All right, it's terrible, but <laughs> you know what? Like fairs and carnivals, the game with like the little clowns with the frills on the sides, and you got to throw a, a ball at it and knock them backwards. That's how I feel when I look at she- Shelley Duvall's teeth. Like they're so big and <laughs> wide, and every time I see it, I just want to throw a ball at one. Like it's one of those clowns and knock it inwards, and then like it can come retract back out. <laughs> random as shit but that's what I thought of just that when I saw her teeth they're lucky they don't get in a fucking accident right on the way to the overlook and Danny don't fly through the fucking window (laughs) the windshield man he's just like sitting no seatbelt right in the middle of them like he can go flying through that windshield I like the whole reference to the Donner party every time I see this yeah man just the way Kubrick uses the the music with the close up of Danny in the, in the Overlook when he sees the Grady twins for the first time. Now, when they're standing side to side, one is very slightly shorter than the other. Is that supposed to be like, all right, that's the 8 and 10-year-old? Like, that's a difference? Like, fucking an inch off the top? I doubt it. Don't I? Don't they mention, like, directly the, the tw- them as twins in this movie? Like, when he's in the bathroom later on, Jack? I don't remember, but... I don't know why I'm so transfixed on the twins thing, but they're not goddamn twins. Now let's let's talk uh, Dick Holleran for a minute. 
let's be honest, one of the most useless characters in the story ever. <laughs> he really is in the movie and in the in the book. Just why do you think it became a phrase like guy got Dick Halloran? Whenever somebody who go in a movie that tries to save somebody and then they immediately get murdered as soon as they get there. I think that's like a, a term. I use it all the time. So I'm guessing people use that term, Dick Halloran. But it, it's a term. I use it at least. So that just shows how useless of a character it is. All he does is tell Danny about The Shining, like that he has a shine and tells him a little bit about it after scaring him the shit out of him, like talking to him first, like telepathy, and then... <laughs> Instead of explaining it first, I don't know, but so useless. He just shows up and then axed right to death by Jack. Pretty much like Ken Forey in um, Devil's Rejects when Charlie, when he shows up to uh, rescue the family. Axed right in the chest, Dick Halloran, the fuck right there. And this is so stupid, but here it goes. When I was young, one of the first few times I saw this movie... <clears throat> and ever since, but like it's cemented in my brain, like by the second, third viewing. This, there's a shot of uh, Dick Halloran when he's in Florida, when Danny's doing the awesome shine to him, and he's like leaning back, his head in bed. He looks like a turtle. He looks like my my grandpa <laughs> on my mom's side, my mom's father. He had this big Italian nose, and whenever he'd like fall asleep in his chair and shit like that, drunk and stuff, he would just look like a turtle. And it, it reminded me of that when I saw this movie, it reminded me of my grandpa. And don't worry, he's dead, and he'd be cool with it, fuckers. Now, if you think I'm not going to mention the whole sound design in this movie, you're out of your mind. The whole, all the sequences with Danny on his little uh, bike going around onto the carpet, on the smooth carpet, and then onto the loud ha hardwood floor, onto the carpet, onto the hardwood floor. That's fucking brilliant. It's so excellent. That's that's amazing. So iconic from this movie, too. You know another thing that might have, <laughs> like, tainted this movie for me a little growing up? I can't watch this film, certain scenes in it, without thinking of the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror episode when they're making fun of The Shining. I really can't. Like, certain scenes in this just bring me back to that Treehouse of Horror episode, and I laugh hysterically, and I can't take it seriously. I don't know. It's a me thing, but yeah, thanks, Simpsons. You ruined this for me. Greatest shot in the movie, one of the greatest shots in the film, when Jack is looking over the hedge maze miniature, and it, the, just the transition shot. He's looking down on it, and he sees Wendy and um, Danny walking in the hedge maze. That is so... Oh, it's perfect. It is such a great shot. What an imaginative, creative fucking shot. That is just one of the best in a film. And the, the carpet in the Overlook, with the, you know, the orange, with the black lines, and the repeating patterns, the red and the shape iconic too and just in certain scenes it looks like the patterns change on the floor and i'm pretty goddamn that's one of the things i was talking about in the very beginning i'm pretty damn sure that was deliberate on uh kubrick's part like it has to be like there's a scene when danny's like sitting in one of the designs on the carpet and then he's facing and like the shot from another direction it's in a different pattern and then it goes back to him. So it has to be del delivered by Kubrick for me. Like, it, it has to be. Because we know how he is. And then we get the infamous room 237, which in the book was obviously 217. But this movie ruined that number for me. Every time I see 237 in a horror movie, I instantly think it's a Shining reference. Like, especially if it's like they could have used any number in the world and it ends up being 237. Most of the time, yeah, it's an homage to The Shining. Now, I still, to this day, have not read or seen Dr. Sleep, the sequel, which is Mike Flanagan, who I adore Mike Flanagan. I got to start doing some of his movies here, man, like Oculus and um, Absentia and Ouija uh, 2, Origin of Evil, the prequel. Uh, he has so many great films, man. I love Mike Flanagan. So... Maybe I'll do Oculus soon. That's my favorite film by him. Fucking out there. Love it. If you haven't noticed the last few videos and movies I've been doing, like, I like it. Weird out there shit. 
fucking Santa Sangre and uh, Dead Alive. And now I'm talking about this. But when the shot of Jack, when they zoom in on him, with his, it's the eyebrows, man. It's always the eyebrows with Jack. Like, his eyebrows are just like demented. And he's just making that terrible, evil stare. Like, he still looks the same as from the beginning. He still looks just the same old crazy Jack Nicholson. He, he already lost his mind. Hello, Danny. Come play with us. Brilliant. What a great scene with the twins and stuff. And again, his performance, man. He looks terrified this kid what a great performance by this kid man and i love we get the intercut uh shots of their mutilated bodies with the axe and shit on the ground same weapon that jack goes to try to kill his family with perfect yeah this shot right here when danny's sitting playing with his trucks and he's sitting in the middle of the the shape on the carpet the black line is coming away from danny like, the way you're seeing me is we're looking at Danny. The line's coming this way, and the ball rolls down the black line. Uh, then when they show the shot from Danny's perspective down the hallway, the black line is going behind Danny backwards. So that changes. Definitely deliberate. It's to feel more disorienting. Absolutely. When Jack is having the nightmare, and he wakes up, he's screaming, and Wendy comes to him, and he says that, uh, I just had the most terrible dream that I... I kill you. I killed you and Danny, and I cut you up into little pieces. I'm out. Like <laughs> that's when I leave. If I'm I'm the wife, get that kid out and you out of there immediately. Your husband just said he had a dream about murdering you and chopping you into little pieces. It's time to leave. Like this would be my cue. Hey, Danny, time to get the fuck out of Dodge. We gotta leave this hotel. We're leaving Daddy for a bit. The entire bar sequence with Lloyd. That's all I'll say. The whole bar sequence is, is perfection. This is another example of mirror imaging and of doubles that we get here with the woman in 237. Now, when I, was, when I first saw this movie, man, the old woman in that tub, when she gets out, and I saw this nine, ten years old, maybe, seeing this old woman completely naked with a wrinkled ass body and her pussy just everything just right there in the open and walking towards Danny I was terrified of that woman she still creeps me out man the old version the young version's cool <laughs> the one Jack sees that one's fine old one oh it still terrifies me to this day I'll never forget that and gremlins the, the ending monologue from the father and saying like check on your bed and check the closets there might be a gremlin in your house that shit terrified me as a kid too these two things probably the biggest movies that had moments that terrified me growing up this old bitch yeah she's like number one or two but then when jack goes and sees the young version it cured all of that fear <laughs> in that nine ten year old me and then, of course, Jack is blamed for hurting Danny's arm, just like he did when he was drunk. I think it was five months prior, he says. Wendy's weird at the beginning of this. She says that Jack st stopped drinking or tried to stop drinking like two years ago, but now he's sober for five months. Like, I forget exactly what she says, but it's, it's weird the way that she words it at the beginning. But I think it was five months ago that he ended up uh, hurting, da breaking Danny's arm on accident when he was drunk. Forgot where I was going with that. The whole ball scene, like when all the ghosts and from the past and stuff are in the uh, the bar room, and Jack is back at the bar, and Lloyd's there, and everyone is. I know that Kubrick actually, since he you know was such a prolific filmmaker, he's been around extras that like pretend to talk in the background, and it looks really fake because they gesture a lot. So like he basically made sure that like everybody in the background here was acted natural and just like talked and had a regular conversation just without you know talking and it, it pays off because it, it looks so much more natural and it looks eerie too that the way how everybody looks like they're actually acting naturally it's an eerie scene and all the shots in the bathroom just the red the color usage the the cinematography the way it's shot the way it looks the, 
excellent. And the whole conversation with Grady's ghost and telling them that he has to, he hasn't done it yet. He has to take care of his fucking family and kill them. And man, just imagine being in this guy's situation. Now, is he actually drunk? Does he get drunk in this? I doubt it. I think it's all in his mind and the hotel. You know, that's fucking with them because that's the whole theory there is are there actually ghosts here? Or is this just Jack, you know, losing his mind and imagining all of this? And it's projecting onto Danny and Wendy. I mean, they're they're in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of winter, in this hotel, this huge hotel that's like a, a labyrinth. And they're the three of them alone, day after day after day day you'd want i'd want to fucking kill somebody too like maybe even my family (laughs) like seriously so the whole ghost versus you know just him being insane and losing his mind or the whatever thing i think the scene that's pivotal in that is when he's locked in the pantry because up until then everything can be explained away by it being jack losing his mind and that there aren't any ghosts. But he gets locked in that pantry. And then Grady ends up unlocking it. So this, for me there's no other way that he got out of that pantry. If, unless ghosts have to exist here. Like this has to be real. The hotel has to be haunted. And he has to be actually seeing these things. It's not just him losing his mind and seeing stuff. And him being a lunatic. So that's where the whole ghost versus no ghost things ends with me like there's absolutely paranormal stuff going on here yo they say it's snowing like mad out it's a huge snowstorm this motherfucker dick halloran's able to get a flight from florida right into colorado here and then they say all the flights are canceled and stuff this motherfucker was able to get a flight that's so fucking out there that's so stupid that makes zero sense and it's always bothered me now of course the iconic scene with Wendy going in into the typewriter and looking at the pages and all work and no play make Jack a dull boy over and over and over again. It's iconic. It's it's masterful. The tension is off the rails in this whole scene. And when he comes in and he starts chasing her up the stairs, I'm just going to bash your goddamn brains. And all of that is perfect. What a great scene. But no TV Again, and no Treehouse of Horror. Homer I can't something. watch this scene oh, without crazy. thinking of Homer. Don't mind if I <laughs> and do. it really takes me out of the film <laughs> nowadays. Like, it's, it's a prop. Oh, but Jesus, man. Nicholson and Duvall, as boy, despite what I've said about her, they absolutely destroy their roles in this scene. Like, absolutely just masterful acting here. She couldn't ask Danny to help drag his father to the to the pantry. I don't know how far it is from the from the room that they were in, but she had to do all that lifting herself. Uh, the red rum scene. What more can you say about it? It is so brilliantly filmed. The the music, the way it it, it intensifies, the way Danny's just walking so slowly with the knife, the way the voice, the way he's saying red rum and. The, takes the lipstick, writes it on the door, and then her reaction when she sees it in reflection of the mirror, again, more mirror stuff. Amazing. We get just the iconic, improvised, on-the-spot Ed McMahon line from (laughs) Jack here when he crashes through the door with the axe. You're Johnny! (laughs) And they're real lucky that the snow, like, reached right to that window and made... (laughs) And that he's able to just slide right down. They got lucky with that. And then Dick Halloran shows up, and Dick Halloran gets Dick Halloran. But just the whole way that Nicholson plays this man, just losing his mind completely. Now he's like hunched back with the axe, like, Danny, Danny boy. Awesome. Like, <laughs> that's so iconic, too, like him doing that. Uh, then we get the scene of the bear. <laughs> the bear with the. the, the assless chap flap on the back of his costume his ass hanging out blowing the dude in the room nothing will convince me this is nothing more just weird just to be weird imagery and it has no actual meaning Kubrick just threw that in there and said fuck it let's just be strange I have no other explanation if anyone does let me know because 
because it's just fucking out there just to be out there. But just the whole ending to this movie is fucking phenomenal. The, the score, the, the music, just intensifying. And the, the Jack's performance, Danny's performance, Shelley's performance, him in the hedge maze. And the, the one thing we all know, people know this movie and behind the scenes and stuff a little bit. As much as a stickler that keeps saying that Kubrick is for getting every detail down, there's no fake breath, you know, you know no ex- exhalation or anything coming out of them in the snow. So I don't know why he didn't think of that. Maybe it's not, maybe it was deliberate. Maybe it's to make it more disorienting. I doubt it. But you could look at it that way. Like maybe he threw that in there. Maybe oh if they don't reckon if they see if they recognize that there's no you know exhalation, there's no breath coming out in the snow. It's just gonna make it more disorienting and weird. Who knows? But I think I think he just fucked up. And I love how Danny outsmarts his dad. And I immediately thought of this movie when I saw It Follows for the first time. Or not It Follows, uh, The Guest. When uh, Michael Monroe does the same thing, like backtracks on her uh, prints, her shoe prints. Same thing, but It Follows. Not Why do I keep thinking It Follows? No, The Guest. Because Michael Monroe's in both of them, that's why. Because um, that scene there reminded me of this movie as soon as I saw it. And then we have the ending with the close-up of the picture right outside the gold room that has Jack front and center in the picture from the 20s. Now, what the fuck does this mean? <laughs> I mean, I think it's pretty well accept- widely accepted that Jack has somehow always been a part of the hotel, that he's always been part of this place. Just like Grady says in the bathroom to him, like, you've always been the caretaker. So he's always been linked to this hotel in some way. Now, a theory that I have heard, and it kind of makes sense, the name of the hotel being the Overlook, that you would think being in such an isolated place, such a big place, a vast hotel like this for the winter with just three of you, that they would have explored every inch of this hotel and they would have seen everything. But yet the one thing that they overlook and that is right in front of them the whole time is this picture that has Jack in it. And that makes a lot of sense to me. That he was connected here. Maybe that was a doppelganger of his in the past and the, the Overlook drew him back to reclaim him. Or it's a reincarnation of Jack or something like that. Like, those are the, pretty much the standard uh, interpretations across the board for most people. But the whole Overlook name makes that theory pretty cool to me. That just the one thing that it would shock the shit out of them and that they can't explain has been in front of them the entire time and they completely overlooked it. Just the, there's so many interpretations of this movie, and I'm sure there's so much more out there. I know there is that I didn't talk about, but there's so much in this movie. It's an absolute masterpiece, as I've said, and just Kubrick, man. He's an absolute master. Uh, that's The Shining. Finally got that one out of the way. This was a fun rewatch, and I will talk to you guys soon. Take care, guys. Mm-hmm.